So what you missed there was Jack's hand signals. You have less time. You have less time. Edit every other word. Edit every third word. Talk faster. Excuse me. Uh, I wanted to follow up on what was um, Tim spoke to earlier, and that is um, the connection that Dr. Patrick Hagerty made with a person in his community. Uh, when I first heard news about this, my husband and I were leaving town. It was a dark, gray Saturday morning in Seattle, like this morning. And I'm busy checking my email. And I read this email and I went, what? What, what, wait, did you back? And I went, I gotta read this again. And the email from Patrick was in response to, I'd sent an email to all of the co-authors of an AADR abstract that we submitted for the 2011 meeting, so heard like, I don't know, December, January of um, 11. And he wrote back to the group of us and he said, you all should know that this abstract has directly resulted in a $1 million program, $1 million donation to restart the OHSU GPR program. My husband said, did you, what did you just say? I said, never mind. It really means a lot to me. So that was super exciting. And what Patrick um, has shared with me um, today is that that program is um, even blossoming already and will be active in community-based uh, hospitals and rural locations. So it's gratifying that so many of you participated in a study that has had an immediate and sustainable and very important impact. And thank you very much for your participation. Uh, study team members, Drs. Ed Trulove at the University of Washington, Hiroka Aida, who is now at UNC, the senior oral health consultant for the State Department of Health in Washington, Jocely Alves Dunkerson, uh, Mishan Bettendorf, who I don't think I see here today, our fantastic study coordinator, equally fantastic from Axio Research, Julie Wong and Ruth McBride, and then member dentists who have participated in co-authoring abstracts for AADR in 2011 and 2012. Doctors Patrick Hagerty, back here, you've met earlier, Jackie Jones, I saw you here, Jackie, and um, Gerald Bozeman, you're right there. Thank you very much, appreciate it. So this definition of special health care needs comes from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Uh, there are similar definitions related to adults with special needs. Uh, we don't need to belabor um, the different types of definition, but they do cover um, a wide range of special needs. In the United States, it's estimated that currently about 14% of children have a special need. Among those children with a special need, 78% of them are overdue for treatment or an evaluation. And also within the US, um, from some recent studies, we know that adults are more likely to receive, uh, adults with special needs, more likely to receive care than children who have the same special need. Few studies have been done, conducted on dentist attitudes, beliefs, knowledge and treatment patterns related to providing care to individuals with special needs. In fact, there have only been two studies in the last decade, uh, one in 2004 of the ADA general membership, those at a, attending an annual meeting, and in 2005 for, uh, among Michigan dentists, and before that there were few studies. So our goal in this study among you member dentists was to determine your training, beliefs, and practice patterns regarding treatment to both patients that were adult patients and pediatric patients with special needs, mild to moderate special needs. We were not asking you about treating adults and children with severe special needs. We wanted to know how often you treat adult patients with special needs and pediatric patients with special needs? What kind of dental school training did you have related to treating a variety of different special needs conditions? What kind of behavior management procedures did you use? And what pre pediatric procedures 
were you often employing? What are the barriers you experience in providing care to individuals with special needs? And do you want more training? If you're not doing it, do you care to get more training? Maybe, maybe not. Those are the things that we were interested in finding in this study. So the study took place in uh, 2010 to early 2011. Our goal was to enroll 300 of you. It was an anonymous survey. We really wanted to get honest and accurate information from you as this can help us build programs for practicing dentists as well as for dental students. And it's an important patient population where you may not be inclined to give us your straightforward answers if the data were identifiable. We believe that among you we have great trust and you have great trust, we have trust in you obviously, we believe you have great trust in us. Um, and that's why we thought we could get really honest and straightforward responses that will really serve us well. We invited 357 active members and friends of precedent to participate. It was a web-based cross-sectional survey. You were mailed an invitation. A week later, you received an email with an encrypted link which you would open and then complete the survey. Of course, we made a paper copy available if that was your desire. And for those of you who didn't respond right away, uh, you were contacted as needed a week two and three weeks after that initial invitation was sent out. So results. Uh, what, I, what I should also say is that in the introductory text to the survey, we did state whether or not you treat patients with special needs because we wanted to know from everybody. We did not want to know only from individuals, dentists who were treating patients with special needs. So we got a fantastic response rate. Thank you again for uh, participating, 286 of you. Uh, no surprise to see the demographics there, about 50 years of age. I thought the age range was fascinating uh, and that most of you participants, male, white, had graduated on average about 23 years ago and 95% of you indicate that you do treat children. So what kind of conditions do you treat and what are the procedures you use? And I'm going to read off some of these because I don't trust myself. Uh, I might start making up numbers and that wouldn't work well for any of us. Uh, so for the, this and the following four slides, the question to you was, how often do you treat adults with the following conditions in your practice? And then we listed a number of, of conditions. We then went on later in the survey and asked you the same questions relative to treating children with the same conditions. So you'll see here for respiratory disorders such as asthma and allergy, uh, there was 92% of you provided treatment to adults with, one, with these conditions and about 84% to children. And a similar pattern with diabetes, uh, controlled diabetes, although a few less of you treating children uh, with diabetes. For individuals in wheelchairs, substantial difference between treating adults and children in a wheelchair. Some of this could be a function of age because you're more likely to see adults in a wheelchair than children. Uh, however, that may not hold quite so true, certainly to some degree an age discrepancy typically between adults and children, but quite a difference uh, in the rates at which you're seeing adults and children with these conditions. And just among adults with hearing and vision impairment, um, that 70% of you indicated providing treatment to patients with one of those conditions. For these more medically compromised conditions, um, a post-surgical cleft palate or cleft lip, um, the range was 35, 38% adult children um, treating that population. For individuals with a congenital cardiac disorder, 52% uh, of you indicated providing care to adult patients 
with this condition, but only about 35% of you for children. Uh, for HIV positive, it was about 34% of you are treating adults who are HIV positive, and 8% for children who are HIV positive. And of course, we know that we're more likely to see a higher rate of HIV in an adult population than a pediatric population. Uh, for treating individuals with attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you're more likely to treat children with the condition than uh, adults. Uh, and most of you are treating individuals with ADD or ADHD, and we typically think of that being a condition uh, that we're more likely to encounter among the young than the old. Uh, that's how we typically think. Um, the label here, psychological, emotional concerns, the example that we provided there was anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. So again, you're treating a high number of patients um, who have those disorders. There's a, a higher rate for treating adults with those conditions. It may be age specific or may not be. Um, and neurological disorders, we included Huntington's and MS, um, multiple sclerosis as examples for that. And again, that may be age related, uh, but only 44% of you are providing treatment to adults who have a neurological condition. Um, and Alzheimer's, dementia, about 56% of you are treating adults with that condition. And of course, we don't include information um, for children for that. Um, and the ADD, ADHD, I should mention, that's a mild to moderate manifestation of the condition. And so as we go to these next conditions, um, for intellectual disability, autism, and cerebral palsy, we also included that that was a mild to moderate manifestation of the condition, that we only wanted to hear the rates at which you were providing treatment under those circumstances, not individuals who were more severely impacted by their condition. Um, and again, we, we talk of um, this being intellectual disability, the term phrase uh, diagnosis mental retardation is not one that is typically used any longer. Uh, and the rates of treating adults and children for ID and also for autism are relatively similar. There aren't significant differences between treating adults and children with the condition, and you're treating them on average between 40 and 50 um, percent of you are providing care to those individuals. Cerebral palsy, less than 25 percent of you are providing care to adults or children with a mild to moderate manifestation of cerebral palsy and um, fewer than 30% of you are providing care to adults with traumatic brain injury and 18% uh, of children with TBI. You do lots of the pediatric procedures. Uh, obviously a hier hierarchical arrangement here, topical floor, diet counseling, sealants. Um, falls off a little bit when we get to infinite exams, which is a relatively new phenomenon for some of us who have been in dentistry for quite a number of years. 62% of you report doing infant exams, which I found very encouraging given that it is something um, that has been advocated um, more strongly and, um, in recent years. And then stainless steel crowns, about 48% of you report doing uh, those. As far as behavior management, protocols that you use with your pediatric patients. Just about everybody is using the tell, show, do approach, allowing the parent or caregiver to be present in the treatment room or operatory while you deliver care, and using voice control. Very few of you indicate that you, you are using immobilization devices such as papoose boards or hand over mouth technique, which is no longer being advocated in um, training programs, um, we're still using immobilization devices, but of course with parent consent. So what kind of training did you get in school? Good, bad, type. It was all great, right? Bliss and happiness, dental school. Uh, so on these slides, 
Uh, in the red, that indicates that you got no training in that condition. The light blue, you got didactic lecture material. And the darker blue indicates you got the opportunity to see patients with the condition. You could clearly have both didactic and clinical training. They're not mutually exclusive categories, so don't bother trying to make it add up to 100 because it's not meant to. Um, so in these common conditions of asthma, allergies, and diabetes, uh, not everybody got training. Not everybody got didactic training. Maybe it was just clinical. We, we don't know. Um, fair number of you got the didactic training, and a lot of you got clinical opportunities, and just a few in, um, of you indicated you didn't get any training. Um, some of you reported you didn't get any training in working with patients who were wheelchair bound or had a hearing or vision impairment, a third of you without training uh, of any kind in hearing and, ver hearing and vision impairment. Uh, some didactic training, clinical training to a lesser extent, less than 40% of you got training or the opportunity to see patients with any of these conditions. And so you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to read each of these to you, but you can see that sometimes you got didactic uh, lecture, sometimes you got some clinical, but not really robust clinical training. I would, shouldn't say robust. Not everybody got clinical training. Not everybody got the opportunity to see individuals with a variety of different conditions. See, I'm editing out every third word, Jack. You should be pleased. Uh, and then in these conditions, interesting, post-surgical repair of cleft lip and palate, quite a bit of didactic training. And I wondered when I looked at this if that was maybe a function of the year since graduation because cleft lip and palate was more prevalent in years gone by. And we learned, we talked about it more. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I just speculated about it. Um, and quite a bit of didact, quite a few of you got didactic training in cardiac and HIV positive conditions. And across those three conditions, less than 28% um, of you had the opportunity to provide clinical care while you were in dental school in those conditions. Again, didactic, you know, not, not getting all the training. Not getting all the didactic, not everybody got didactic, a lot less in um, clinical training. Again, autism, 18%. Intellectual disability, opportunity to treat somebody, 40%. Cerebral palsy, 19%. Traumatic brain injury, uh, 11%. So infant oral exam, about 65, 68% of you have had the opportunity to get trained in school, and 40% of you got to do it while in school. Uh, so we're out there busy advocating that children have that uh, first exam by their first birthday. Uh, we're going to have to do something maybe a little bit different in dental school to get us up to speed. Lots of you got training in uh, providing sealants, not so much with the preventive resin restorations, and so on, and of course, fluoride and diet counseling uh, may be um, a reflection of the age of us in this group, or maybe a reflection of what's still going on in dental school. Lots of training in the uh, behavior management procedures that uh, we saw there was a high rate of utilizing those procedures, still getting didactic training in hand over mouth um, by report from when you were in school and immobilization devices. Barriers to providing care. Are there any? You bet there are, right? Did everybody just fall asleep? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> there are barriers to providing care, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, what are they? Uh, 
among both your adult patients and your child patients, the patient's behavior, how they are in the dental operatory is the biggest barrier to providing care to them. Their level of behavioral, emotional, or mental disability is a major barrier to providing care to both adults and children with special needs. Their medical disability status. What do you have to know about their medications? What are the contraindications for care? Their level of dental disease. How much caries, perio, maybe mucosal findings. The level of dental disease was a significant barrier. 29% of you rated that, that as a higher medium effect for adults, and 43% of you rated it as a high or medium effect in treating children. Uh, their physical disability, about a third for both adults and children. Adequate reimbursement for the procedure rendered. Are you getting paid enough for what you're doing? A third of you say, that's a barrier. What about my staff? Do I have staff that are competent, skilled, and able to deliver care with me in the care of these patients? And what's my own level of training? 29 and 27% of you said, that's, that's a barrier. OK, this is sort of my favorite part. Um, maybe Drs. DiNucci and um, Gilbert and Fellows will be interested in this. You want more training? I was super excited when I saw this. So the question we asked, well, first of all, we stated, the following questions refer to your attitudes regarding additional training. Which response best represents the desire you have to receive additional training for patients with the following conditions? And the response categories were very desirable, desirable, and somewhat desirable, which are these data collapsed here. Um, your other choices were not desirable or that your prior training was sufficient so that you didn't deem additional um, training was necessary. So 55% of you indicated that you would like to receive more training in working with people who are in a wheelchair, people who are hearing impaired, vision impaired, or on the far side, HIV positive. For all other conditions, it ranged from 50, wait, 65, excuse me, 65 to 75 percent of you want more training in those conditions. I think that's pretty profound. And it gets more interesting. Pediatric procedures, you want some more training in a few of the areas, less training in the preventive resins, which are not as likely to do topical fluoride and sealants. Behavior management. The only, although you're doing the tell, show, do, the voice control, and having the parent present in the operatory, 40% of you still would like some more training in those domains, and few of you want more training in immobilization devices and hand over mouth. And then in these patient management areas, uh, let me read to you what the, that said, because I think I don't want to lose the flavor of this. So 86% of you said you would like more training in the complex oral manifestations of specific conditions and treatments. 86% of you wanted more training in medical complications of conditions, medication management, and medical consultations. How do you co consult with your medical colleagues about a condition? You wanted, um, let's see, 81% of you wanted more training in dealing with disruptive physical and verbal behaviors. And the last category, an assessment of the best fit. So in making your diagnoses, what is the best treatment fit for the person based on what their special needs condition is? This one I also found really, really interesting. Uh, about 80% of you 
want more training on how do I come up with a schedule and staff management strategies to stay productive? How do I coordinate with other healthcare providers and agencies? Working with caregivers, adherence to treatment recommendations, provision of complete medical and medication histories. How often do we get frustrated when we don't know what meds they're on? Do we ever get frustrated by that? You're sort of awake, thank God a break's coming up, woo! Um, and communication with the dental office. You want staff training in behavior management procedures, working with patients with special needs conditions and pediatric procedures. So there are a lot of people with special needs who don't receive regular dental evaluation and treatment. Some of this, certainly not all of it, but some of it can be explained by a lack of access to dentists who have the education and clinical training to provide care. Dentists in this study have indicated a desire to receive training in the treatment and management of patients with special needs. We can provide CDE courses, lecture and clinical ones over multiple conditions as we've already demonstrated on patient management strategies, working in the office and staff training. We can improve our dental school curricula following the same protocols and fact sheets that have already been developed can be further enhanced by adding more conditions. In summary, in this study, we had a terrific uh, response rate. Treatment is provided in some special needs conditions more than others. Adults are more likely to provide treatment within the same condition for a variety of different reasons. Um, some pediatric and behavior management procedures are used more than others. On average, less than 40% of you receive clinical training in a variety of special needs conditions. And the greatest barriers to providing care are a person's behavior, their level of disability, whether it's behavioral, emotional, mental, or medical. You want more training. So again, we can target CE courses, dental school curricula, improve on fact sheets out there in use. I think these findings provide a really rich environment for us to provide additional training, which could ultimately help improve access to care for individuals with special needs. Thank you. Did I leave out enough words? Awesome. You are awesome. Thank you. Uh, questions, please. They want to go to break. No, but we have time. They want to go to break. I, I have, <laughs> I actually, oh, good. Jackie's good. Hey, Jackie. Well, I want to know um, where you can get these informational fact sheets to be used by the dental professionals, because I'm not aware of where you can find them unless you go to each specific disease entity and try and find something about dentistry on them. Uh, thank you very much for asking. That wasn't a plug, but I really appreciate it. Uh, as part of a broader project, you uh, probably didn't notice on the first slide, I ended, indicated HRSA uh, is a funding source, and that is because HRSA provided funding for my um, time to then do this NIDCR-sponsored research. Um, and part of the broader project, we developed a series of what we call informational fact sheets across a number of conditions, not all special needs conditions, but very prevalent conditions. And um, I put together an amazing team of people in pediatrics and pediatric dentistry and behavioral medicine and public health and have a series of fact sheets for children and for adults. So dental professionals, they're targeted to you, adult, child, and then we have a series of, this, for the same conditions, fact sheets for medical professionals and the things that they need to know, and then also for parents and caregivers. So where can you find these? If you Google oral health fact sheets, special needs, they'll pop up. Um, if you go to the University of Washington website and put in special needs fact sheets, they'll come up. If you write to me, I'd be happy to forward it to you. The uh, fact sheets are posted on a number of websites in the state, nationally and internationally, a state and territorial dental directors, ADA sent out a news bulletin about them, the State Dental Association, State Dental Hygiene Association, um, so on and so forth. And um, they are 
really, really useful. I'm hearing from dentists all around the country and internationally that they're really helping to get them to feel more comfortable in providing care to individuals with mild to moderate manifestations of special needs, not somebody who's so severely impacted that they're off to the OR um, or conscious sedation. Very interesting, thank you. Um, what's the difference between, um, there's an organization, I think it's called Special Care Dentistry. Special Care Dentistry and, Association. And what you're talking about. And I see, what I see here are workforce issues. Because yes, if, you're, if you're going to train people, you've got to have a workforce that's actually trained in providing this. So what's, uh, what's the plan? What's the plan? <laughs> well, that's why I called you guys out. They all want more training. You've got the money. <laughs> Yes, and uh, it really is determining if NIDCR is the best funding source or if it's a HRSA or Kellogg or it may be even a Pew uh, initiative, but uh, it, uh, clearly there is a ripe opportunity to do more work, and provide the training, and get people out there in the field, and really some didactic training. I think when we come to talking about educating and training people in special needs, we take the easier route and do um, didactic. What I should mention is there's a free CE course, or $40 CE course available just now on the University of Washington website um, based on these fact sheets. Um, so that's a start, but there's got to be a whole lot more. So, so you just sort of alluded to this. My question was going to be, do you, is there a relationship between practitioners who want more training who had either didactic or clinical? In other words, if they had clinical training, do they, are they less likely now to want more training? But if they only had didactic, are they more likely to want I more training? I can't answer that because we haven't done all the correlational analyses. Do you have, do you have any idea? I, my impression is if, and there's some data um, to support this from some other group that um, Michigan and then Susie Seal and Paul Casamassimo, and that is if you, Interesting. If you get clinical training, you're more likely to do cl clinical training in dental school is a good predictor of doing clinical practice. Conflicting data on if you're AEGD GPR trained, whether or not you're more likely to treat people with special needs. And what data that I didn't show here is that in you is that there is no difference in as far as the different special needs conditions. If you're AEGD, GPR trained dentist, you're equally likely as a non-AEGD, GPR trained dentist to treat adults with the same special needs condition. It's different for three conditions for children where the AEGD, GPR dentists are more likely to train children with cerebral palsy, autism, and it might be intellectual disability, but the third one's not coming to me right now. Otherwise, uh, so it, which is in contrast to the group out of Michigan that found that um, it wasn't correlated with um, more likely to treat. But that could also be a re result of the community that you're practicing in, and you're the only game. There isn't anybody else. Any other? Questions? If not, thanks, Kimberly. Thank you. Okay, 